excited to have you joining this Hangouts on Air. Um, this is a, a bit of an experiment. Uh, uh, my co-author, Chris Field, and I have a new book that has just been released in the last couple of minutes uh, the, on the Science Magazine webpage. It's in the, the current issue of Science, which is focused on a special section of uh, natural systems in a changing climate. And uh, Chris and I have the introductory review paper uh, for this special section. So uh, we're, we're excited to have the have the paper out now. Uh, the press embargo has just been lifted. The paper is now up on the, the science webpage as of as of 2 p.m. Eastern time, and uh, I'd like to share the results uh, of the of the review paper. What we've what we've found in the review. Uh, we've got a couple of people joining us in the hangout right now. Um, Carlos Ochoa and uh, some. Um, and uh, if you if you want to get in the hangout, uh, it's you can get on on the profile my profile page on Google Plus, uh, also in the page, and uh, it'll, it's also up on YouTube. Share um, one of the figures here. We'll see if we can get that up. Um, uh, one thing. Uh, yes. Yeah, yeah. Can we can we get the link to the paper which has been uploaded now? Yeah, absolutely. Let me do that. Um, <laughs> trying to find it here. Uh, looks like it's just a. It's actually if you go to the Science Magazine webpage, it's the image is up now, um, and it looks like an empty link at the moment. So. Uh, go to go to science mag www.sciencemag.org and it has um, it's the the special section special issue once in future climate is the headline on the on the website. So can you see the uh, can you see the screen share now? Uh, we have a have a couple others joining us. Uh, Euro Maestro, I see. I recognize your icon. Um, Okay. Right. okay. Here we go. We'll we'll go ahead and uh, start with these with these figures here. Um, so what I have up on the screen right now um, is all right. Can you guys see what I have on my screen? I'm getting a lot of open capture and whatnot. Sam, can you see the figures up on the screen? Yeah. 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 Okay. All right. So if you if you look at um, at the figures here, what we're showing on the left are maps of of temperature, and what we're showing on the right are maps of precipitation. And our review article is focused on the physical climate uh, and 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 particular uh, aspects of the physical climate that are likely to be important for. Um, Terrestrial ecosystems and impacts on terrestrial ecosystems. So, uh, this is Figure One from the paper, and the the top two panels, left and right, show observed changes in temperature on the left and observed changes in precipitation on the right. So, if you look at at, at temperature, this is uh, from um, the mid 1950s to mid 1970s as a as a baseline, and then the the late 20th century. Uh, so so the later period minus the earlier period, and you see orange over over most land regions. So uh, this is showing that that most land regions in in this uh, temperature data set have uh, increased by you know, on the order of about a of about a three. Uh, uh, on the on the high end, and uh, with some areas showing showing little appreciable change, um, but overall warmer warmer land area uh, in in the in the recent climate relative to the mid 20th century. And if we look uh, going down the rows uh, for the middle and sorry going down the columns for the middle and and bottom panels, we're showing results from a suite of global climate model experiments. This is on the left, annual temperature. I'll just focus on the annual temperature right now. 
and uh, these are projections from 27 uh, global climate models of the annual temperature change relative to the late 20th century baseline for the mid 21st century and the late 21st century and you can see that uh, in the mid 21st century that uh, terrestrial areas throughout the globe experience um, warming uh, most areas between between two and four degrees of annual temperature in the mid 21st century and uh, warming between four and six degrees uh, of, for, for annual temperature in the late 21st century. And uh, the high latitude areas uh, experience uh, more uh, substantial warming uh, from, from six to even up to, up to 12 degrees of annual warming uh, over uh, in the late 21st century period. Now there's also uh, a robust um, patterns of of changes in precipitation, and these have been identified in, in previous um, previous analyses as well. Um, and, and we can talk about those those precipitation changes if you if you want. Uh, I want to move next to to uh, the the second figure in the review, which is um, focuses on extremes because uh, these annual changes in annual temperature and precipitation are um, you know they they. Uh, where they're likely to have the greatest impact based on on the current climate, where we see vulnerability in the current climate, uh, is through um, not through changes in the annual mean, but through through changes in in the seasonality and changes in the occurrence of extreme events. And um, this upper left panel is this, there's a zoom of this that's up on the science website right now. Uh, so this is showing the percentage of years that uh, have uh, a, a extreme June, July, August season. And uh, the, the paper that this, that this comes from has, uh, has uh, the other, other uh, hemisphere, summer, summer and winter from both hemispheres shown. But in this case, we're just showing this June, July, August. And uh, everywhere that's reddish, right, uh, the, these dark oranges and reds are areas where the temperature that, that was the hottest uh, June, July, August temperature of the late 20th century occurs 80 to 100 percent of the years. So essentially this is the one in 20 hottest uh, season uh, every in the current climate everywhere that, that's orange and red is uh, that hottest, one in 20 hottest season is occurring eight, nine, ten times out of every ten years. So it's the one in two decade event becoming the, the eight or nine in one decade event. So with this two to four degrees of, of global warming, or sorry, of, of, of local and regional warming at the annual scale, there are substantial increases in, in the occurrence of extremely hot seasons. And if we look on the upper right, this is just one example over uh, northern South America of looking at the historical period and asking how much of that uh, land area over northern South America uh, is, ha has been experiencing um, a change in, in the occurrence of extremely hot seasons. And you can see, in fact, the, the land area increasing in, in temperature observations over the late 20th century. So what's uh, projected in these climate model projections, in fact, has been seen in, in the historical period uh, and when we look at observations and the model simulations of, of the historical period likewise show very similar increase as the observations. Um, another example of potential impact uh, in, in terms of, of climate uh, climate phenomena that, that's, that, that can have high impact in the current climate is extremely low snow years and in particularly in the western uh, western North America where I live but also in in, um, in parts of Eurasia uh, the, the these climate model simulations uh, are, are indicating the likelihood of, of increasing occurrence of uh, extremely low snow years, and this can have implications for stream flow, uh, for vulnerability of forests to wildfire, and other other potential impacts. So the point here is that uh, 
the annual scale temperature change uh, really is likely to be felt most acutely by terrestrial ecosystems through the effects of, of extreme events. Um, I'll go quickly uh, now through, through the next couple of figures in the paper, and then I want to see if there are questions. Uh, the, the third figure in the paper tries uh, to, to uh, place the, the, um, the greenhouse gas changes that, uh, that have been seen uh, over recent decades and that are uh, projected to, to be seen uh, in different scenarios of, of the future within the context of the longer geologic record. So uh, what I have up on the screen now is third figure from the review paper. And this shows uh, carbon dioxide concentrations in the atmosphere in for four different, uh, four different worlds from, from four different sources. So on the left, this is a, a collection of reconstructed carbon dioxide concentrations based on geologic proxies. And this is from uh, Dana Royer's work. And uh, the, the dark green line is the mean of the multiple uh, proxy, geologic proxies for, for past carbon dioxide concentration. And you can see that the, the time scale is going from about 22 million years ago on the left up until the recent past. And this gray line is the 400 parts per million line. And, and, and uh, Earth has just recently uh, crossed that, that uh, carbon dioxide threshold. Um, so the, you can see that, that for most of the last 20 million years, the carbon dioxide concentrations have, have most likely, uh, there's some variation in the proxies, but have most likely been below uh, the, the current values with some, some episodes of, of uh, higher, higher concentrations uh, during that, that 22 million years. The second panel on the left uh, shows the, uh, the measurements of carbon dioxide from Antarctic ice cores, and this record now extends back uh, almost a million years, so 800,000 years of record. So these are direct measurements of carbon dioxide in, in ice cores. And you can see that uh, these variations, which have been very thoroughly studied in, in, uh, in these, this ice core record, and uh, the, the variations have been from about 180 parts per million CO2 to about 280 parts per million CO2 over this, over this period. Um, and uh, the, the difference between uh, the, these variations um, in, in the ice core record and the modern uh, concentrations of about 400 parts per million uh, have been well studied and are well, well known to be due to, to human activities, primarily burning of fossil fuels and also deforestation. So that's the, that's the paleoclimate context in terms of the, the, the past uh, greenhouse forcing. And <clears throat> if we look in the, in the third panel from the left, uh, we see the the different scenarios of uh, carbon dioxide concentrations uh, going forward over the next century. And these are the, the scenarios that have been used in the climate model simulations that, that we were looking at in the first two figures. And what I showed you uh, in that first figure with the mean temperature and precipitation was along this pathway, this RCP 8.5 pathway. And you can see that, that the carbon dioxide concentrations uh, reach up above uh, twice their, their current values in this scenario over the next century. And these other lines show uh, other, other scenarios, other, other pathways that, that the community, the scientific community has identified as, as being illustrative of potential pathways for the next century. Uh, I want to note that this, this, this lowest, most yellow curve, um, the RCP 2.6 pathway, that this requires, in order to achieve this pathway, requires negative carbon dioxide emissions uh, starting in about, uh, at, at the latest in the mid uh, 21st century. So this is, uh, what we mean by negative emissions are that 
the net result of all human activities is a decrease each year in, in the uh, CO2 concentration in the atmosphere. So that's, that's achievable, it's possible, it's within the realm of possibility, but the reality is that the real carbon dioxide emissions have been tracking along and even above this, this RCP 8.5, this highest pathway. So uh, in our review paper, and this is something we can discuss if you're interested, in our review paper we've, we've, we've discussed results from, from this range of pathways, but we focus mostly on RCP 8.5, uh, both because it spans, you know, there, if we look at the whole century of RCP 8.5, it spans the whole forcing window that, that's, that's, uh, that's spanned by these RCPs, uh, by these four lines, uh, but it also is the closest to the trajectory that, that the real world has been on uh, it, over, over recent years. All right, so the last panel, which has much higher values than, than, uh, than the others, uh, is is a set of results uh, uh, from uh, essentially a, you know, a thought experiment of, of what would the the carbon dioxide concentrations be if all of the um, if all of the fossil fuel reserves were combusted and and I say it's a thought experiment because it, it did use um, it did use uh, robust geochemical models uh, but and, and and the way that the experiment was was conducted was as a pulse. If all of the if all of the the, the fossil carbon reserves were combusted at once, uh, about 5,000 petagrams of carbon, which is which is on the order of 20,000 uh, gigatons of CO2, if that was injected in the atmosphere as a pulse, how long would would that carbon dioxide stay in the atmosphere? And so from this sweep of of state of the science uh, biogeochemical models, you can see uh, that in fact the uh, the CO2 concentrations are likely to stay uh, above uh, twice the current values for at least a thousand years and reach potentially uh, as high as as five times the current values as a result of that pulse. And so there's an important contrast between these uh, these trajectories in, in the red and orange that are that are uh, considered to be plausible uh, pathways uh, given given population growth and, and economic growth um, uh, there's a real contrast between the, the those uh, and the total uh, the total inventory of, of fossil fuels all all being consumed which would have uh, from these results clearly would have uh, very long-term uh, consequences for the atmosphere. Um, all right, so the fourth the fourth uh, figure in the paper um, asks the, this a, a question about velocity of climate change, and uh, the, the velocity is is a concept velocity of climate change is a concept that's emerged in the literature in the last few years, and the idea is to try to quantify how rapidly in space, uh, the climate changes, and and we can think about this if if there were uh, species, for example, that that needed to maintain their current climate, how f how far does does their current climate move in how many years, basically? So, what's the kilometers per year that that the climate moves? And uh, the the bottom panel is a figure from from Laurie et al. Uh, in 2009, and what they did was they looked at the current uh, spatial gradients. So, if we look at any grid point on planet Earth, how uh, how much does the does the temperature vary around that grid point? That defines the gradient. And then, if and when they look at climate model projections of the future, they can take the degrees per year and the degrees per kilometer of the gradient and, and calculate a kilometers per year based on, based on those numbers given the dimensions. And so uh, we, we, uh, we're showing that in the bottom panel and then we're comparing that with uh, another potential uh, framing of, of the question of velocity of climate change, which is to, if we look at any point on planet Earth and ask, uh, given its annual temperature, where in the future climate does that same annual temperature occur? And we can identify all those, all those points in the future climate that have the same annual temperature 
as our original grid point does now. And then we can find the closest of those grid points and calculate the distance between those points and, and over a century than we have a, a velocity. And uh, I'll focus on the top panel uh, for a second. And what you see is, 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 is quite intuitive in that uh, the poleward edges of continents uh, turn out to uh, you know, come out of this analysis as, as having high velocity and high elevation areas, uh, particularly the Tibetan Plateau, but also in South America, North America, um, and, and, and East Africa. Uh, they also, these high elevation areas also come out as, as having high velocity. And this is essentially a result of uh, topographic limits and, and continental limits to, uh, to uh, the, the temperature change. So uh, we, we know that, that uh, temperature tends to decrease as we go up in elevation for, for thermodynamic reasons. And also the temperature tends to decrease as we go uh, towards the poles in latitude. And so if you think about uh, the same temperature moving poleward with, with mean warming, if, if we run into the ocean, then there's no more land area for that temperature to move. And now, uh, essentially, the, the equivalent temperature of southern Africa has moved off of, of the continent. And likewise with the Tibetan Plateau, there's, at some point there's no more further in elevation to go to find the same temperature with, with annual warming. So that's what's creating these, these patterns. All right, uh, I've talked for a little bit uh, about the results. Um, and so I want to any questions at this point. Yeah. Uh, yeah, Sam, go ahead. So what, can you? Uh, quickly summarize the differences between RCP 8.5 and the other two scenarios. Uh, that is, I think, RCP. Uh, so, there's, so the lowest is the 2.6, and then there's 4.5 and, and 6. Yeah. So, so, and, and the, so, the, so the numbers, the numbers are actually coming from um, the total radiative forcing uh, from human activities at the end of the 21st century. So that, that number code is the RCP uh, 8.5 is, is uh, the 8.5 watts per meter squared forcing. And the 2.6 is 2.6 watts per meter squared forcing. And so the, the way that these pathways were constructed by the community was uh, to try to, try to um, kind of target levels of forcing uh, for the climate system at the end of the 21st century, and then uh, find the the greenhouse gas emissions and emissions of other um, other radiatively important constituents like aerosols and and methane and uh, so other greenhouse gases and other atmospheric constituents that would be consistent with uh, with those levels of forcing. So. It's different than the older older scenarios that you may be familiar with from the literature, where the the um, the IPCC uh, SRES or Special Report on Emission Scenarios that came out uh, in 2000, where uh, those were created using storylines that well, if population growth looks like this, and if economic development looks like this, and if technological change looks like this, then these are plausible scenarios for emissions, and then going forward from emissions to to uh, understand the climate. So this, this approach kind of starts in the middle with some level of forcing, and then there are people moving toward you know, to understand the climate, and there are people moving to understand what kind of technological change would be required to achieve RCP 2.6, for example. Uh, in, terms of the, in terms of the climate change, there's, there's quite a bit of difference between um, RCP 8.5 at the end of the at the end of the 21st century, and the other RCPs, because the forcing is 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 uh, um, quite a bit higher, uh, so the so the global warming is 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 also quite a bit higher. Does that answer the question? Yeah, yeah. And and you said you mentioned that uh, it can be even worse than 8.5 because if we go along the lines we are going now, if we keep the rates of emissions growing at at the rate we are growing now, so it might be even worse than 8.5, you said, right? Yeah. So if we look at the if we look at the real emissions, um, then 
the the real emissions. I can send you the, the the reference for this, but if we look, at the real emissions are have been tracking over the last decade or so have been tracking above the RCP 8.5, um, and and that doesn't mean that that the world will stay on the RCP 8.5 for for the next uh, many decades, but uh, we don't have evidence that uh, the world is moving towards some lower emission trajectory. And really, the business, you know, the quote, business as usual um, scenario with you know, the the same, you know, the, the population growth occurring, um, increase in energy intensity uh, in terms of how much energy uh, is used per capita, uh, also increasing with with economic development um, as people gain the resources to, to get the benefits of increased energy consumption. Um, if, if, you know, the business as usual of a, of a carbon intensive, uh, car, you know, fossil carbon based energy economy, um, if we, if for all of those being the business as usual, then there's potential for, for uh, you know, if we look at that scenario, then it, that's even Potentially more rapid um, emissions growth than is in RCP 8.5, and then if we if we look at that world that 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 Archer at all world of all of the of the fossil fuel reserves being combusted, then then that's a situation where uh, greenhouse gas concentrations are likely to stay considerably higher than than they are now for a very long time, you know, thousands of years. Uh, were there other questions at this stage? All right. There's one. Uh, we have one supplemental figure that I that I can show. Um, uh, and let me putting this up now. The screen share. Um, uh, hey Noah. Yeah. Yeah. Hey, I've got a quick question. Uh, you said that um, most of the terrestrial regions are um, becoming warmer more rapidly. Uh, what what role will that play with you know the melting of the tundra and Arctic regions and the release of methane? Does does that come into consideration in any of your models? Uh, yeah, that's a that's a great question, um, and we do address that a little bit in the review, uh, although it's not um, it's not seen in the directly in the figures. But can you see the maps that I have now up on the screen? So if you look at the if you look at the bottom left map, um, and you look at this hot hot pink color, uh, has some RGB value that would be a, an objective name, but we'll, we'll call it hot pink for now. Um, so this, these are areas it, where, in the late 21st century, the uh, the annual warming is more than six degrees Celsius, and there has been work using recently uh, using these same uh, emissions uh, trajectories that that I'm showing now, uh, asking this very question that 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 you're asking about the the thawing of permafrost, and at what point does um, does uh, is the warming sufficient to thaw permafrost and and as a result release carbon uh, from the permafrost? So just a, a couple of notes of background. One is that uh, much of the high latitudes is uh, is frozen ground, and that permafrost uh, holds carbon. There's carbon stored in that permafrost, and it's kept out of the atmosphere by by being in that frozen ground, and uh, we know the scientific community knows from observing uh, that permafrost, and, and particularly what happens during during warm winters. That warm winter events can um, can thaw that that permafrost. There are other conditions that can cause cause permafrost to thaw. This has been observed in uh, in the Arctic uh, in recent years. Uh, you may have you may have heard about even like the mammoth. The mammoth mummies that are, in, in some cases, are kind of falling out of 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 the permafrost as it thaws. So this is something that's it's not a um, it, it's a question that comes up because of because of recent experience. And so uh, the, the question that Carlos is asking is, uh, what are the implications of this scale of annual warming for the thawing of permafrost? And there 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 are a number of potential feedbacks 
uh, in the Earth system that, that could really affect the trajectory of, um, of climate change. And one of them is, is the potential for this, for, for thawing of permafrost in the high latitudes. And uh, you know, I, th I think that the, you know, one, of the, one of the potential ways that uh, we could have uh, emissions that are, that are higher than, uh, than, these, than these scenarios is, is these kinds of, of feedbacks. And, and there's, there's a, quite a bit of carbon that's stored in these, in these soils. And uh, this is, you know, six degrees of annual warming is, is uh, quite a bit of, of annual warming relative to, to the variability that, um, that those, those soils experience now. So, yeah, I think, I think you're, you're absolutely right, Carlos, that there's a potential for, um, for further emissions from these biogeochemical feedbacks. Thanks, Alan. Questions? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Other questions right now? I'm... I'm I'm totally happy to answer questions. That's great. All right. So this this uh, one more figure that we have in the in the supplement, and you know, I, I uh, talked about the trying to put the the kind of the recent um, recent greenhouse gas concentrations and the. Uh, trajectories of potential future greenhouse gas concentrations within the context of, of the paleoclimate record, the geologic record, and we've also tried to do that with, uh, with this question of velocity of climate change, looking at the global mean temperature in each of these uh, future scenarios and comparing both the magnitude and rate of change uh, with what has been observed uh, recently and what has been observed in the in the geologic record, and so you'll recognize these these reddish colors uh, from from the other figure. So that the reddish colors are are the RCPs, and the x-axis uh, is the rate of change, uh, and the y-axis is uh, the magnitude of change. And you can see that these these RCPs fall along the one to one line. Just that's that's uh, triviality in that. Uh, we're we're showing the temperature range, the magnitude range over uh, one century, and so the the rate per century is going to be one to one. Um, and so you can see that the RCP 8.5 is is uh, substantially a higher level of warming both in the mean and and in the maximum of the range uh, than the other RCPs, um, but they they fall. Uh, they, they, they're, there's pretty. Uh, other people have looked at this question of linearity, and, and in these, it, it, the, the temperature response in these uh, projections is pretty linear with uh, with the level of, of uh, human emissions of greenhouse gases. Um, so the other dots are showing uh, uh, either in green the observed global warming. Uh, so this the green circle here. Um, is just the how much global warming has occurred uh, over the last uh, quarter century or so, and uh, what is that that rate? And so you can see that uh, it's it's uh, a much more rapid um, warming than than occurred during, for example, these Holocene. Uh, so the, the the kind of fluctuations and and changes that occurred during the last ten thousand years. Uh, since the end of the last ice age, and then what the darker, um, the darker blues show are uh, paleoclimate events going back further in time. And so, for example, uh, there was a very long-term cooling that occurred uh, on planet Earth from about 50 million years ago to about uh, 35 million years ago, when when the the Earth went from being in a, a, a hyper Greenhouse state to uh, being being a planet that had uh, a glaciated Antarctica at, at at the South Pole, and so there was a there's long term cooling of, of between 11 and 12 degrees in the deep ocean that occurred over those 18 million years or so, and, and so that that's a larger global temperature change than is seen in these these RCP projections for the next century, 
but it occurred over millions of years. Right? So the rate uh, is, is orders of magnitude smaller for that long-term cooling than, uh, than three or four or five degrees of warming over the next century. Um, so there are other, other uh, paleoclimate uh, events and transitions that are shown here, and, and you can see that they all cluster down uh, on this relatively low rate uh, you know, towards the left of the, of the, uh, of the plot near the origin, uh, near the y-axis. Uh, this, this one with the arrows is interesting. Uh, this is the, the Paleocene-Eocene thermal maximum, and this is, this is uh, probably the most heavily studied uh, uh, rapid uh, warming event in the last, uh, well, certainly in the last 65 million years, but arguably the most heavily studied of, of any rapid warming event um, in, in the geologic past. And uh, this is a period when um, there was there was a pulse of greenhouse gas concentrations in the atmosphere. There was a, a, a relatively rapid warming that occurred, and it's been constrained to be at least five degrees of warming uh, globally in less than ten thousand years. And so, uh, you know, we have mm -hmm. there are some limits to the resolution in these geologic records, and so you can see you know, we have we do have some some uncertainty on those constraints, but still. That, that's, that's a level of warming that's of a similar magnitude of, of the high end of these scenarios, but is still occurring on, as far as, as, far as scientists can tell, on much longer, much longer time scale than, than a century, something thousands, many thousands of years. Um, so you can see that, again, that, uh, the, the difference in, in rate uh, for that paleoclimate event. I do want to say one more thing about, about uh, that that warming event and, and that period of Earth history, it actually provides really strong evidence, really really uh, deep knowledge of how the climate system responds to, uh, to increasing greenhouse forcing. Because uh, we know quite well from uh, geochemical work that, that, uh, that others have done that, uh, that carbon dioxide concentrations increased in the atmosphere. And we know from a variety of, of geologic proxies that that the climate changed. Uh, and, and so during this period, uh, we know that the Arctic uh, was ice-free, at least, at least seasonally, uh, so summers with, with no ice in the Arctic, and that there were alligators and palm trees inside the Arctic Circle. So this is a very different, uh, very different climate than, than what we have now. Uh, and it's the last time that we know that, that greenhouse gas concentrations were uh, at the levels that that uh, we're looking at in in these scenarios for for the next century. Um, that's about what I wanted to say on the um, on that supplemental figure. Are there are there any other questions at this stage? We've been going for going for a good forty minutes, so I don't want to hold people hostage. Um, any other questions? Yeah, some. Yeah, uh, I was checking the figure one uh, in the paper you just published, and in that there is change in precipitation on the right side column. Yeah, it it shows a very uh, uh, interesting trend, uh, uh, which shows that the places like sub-Saharan Africa and the Middle East, which are which are deserts at this point of time and receive very low rainfall, they seem to be there. There seem to be an increase in precipitation in those areas. So, is it kind of a complete reverse climate in a way of the whole of the whole world, which is going to well, happen? So this is this pattern, uh, and you can see you can see if we look at um, if we look on the right. So what Sam is talking about is the precipitation change, and the the middle right panel is the is the mid twenty first century, and the the bottom right panel is the late twenty first century, and you can see that the pattern in the, this is this is taking uh, realizations from more than more than two dozen different climate models and multiple realizations of, of the different climate models. So it's a large uh, it's it's a large ensemble, and and so the um, the you know, th this is the annual average across that ensemble. And you can see that that when we look at that at the ensemble in that way, that the the pattern is is robust. Uh, where with intensification of the the pattern being the same between the different levels of forcing and the 
the magnitude intensifying with higher forcing. And this is a pattern that, that has been identified in, in, in uh, a number of, uh, of papers previously. And essentially, the, uh, the subtropical uh, mid-latitude dry regions that have high, uh, generally high atmospheric pressure in the current, uh, in the current climate, stable atmospheric conditions a lot of the year. Uh, these, these are the areas where the kind of the global deserts uh, occur, these Mediterranean type climates. Uh, you can see these getting, getting progressively browner, um, so drier, you know, brown is negative precipitation change, so drier conditions in the, at the annual scale in the, uh, as, the, as the greenhouse gas concentrations increase. And so <clears throat> there's been a lot of work trying to understand kind of this uh, wet get wetter, dry get drier pattern that appears. I think it, you know, it, it's, it's robust for, for the annual temperature. Uh, it, I think it, you know, it doesn't mean that there won't continue to be wet events in, in areas that are dry. It won't, doesn't mean that there won't continue to be droughts in areas, in areas that are wet. But in general, the most, the most uh, robust changes, uh, and we, uh, we, have in the, we, we have some text discussing uh, the different ways that people measure the, the robustness of these kinds of, of projections. But in general, the most robust changes are the increases in, <clears throat> excuse me, in the high latitudes, increases in precipitation in the high latitudes, and the decreases in precipitation in, in these uh, kind of Mediterranean type climate regions in uh, South America, uh, Southern Africa and, um, and Australia, a, as well as the Mediterranean region itself, uh, and th there has been there has been quite a bit of work uh, in trying to understand this pattern, and it's there. There are robust atmospheric processes that 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 are responsible. Um, I think that <clears throat> you know a lot of my work is is focused on trying to understand in different regions uh, how how do these kinds of large scale patterns. Play out uh, in, in different regions, and I think you know, I, I would caution against looking at the Middle East in this map and drawing conclusions about uh, you know, different countries in the Middle East. But just just as one example, really looking in at a region uh, like that really requires um, resolving the resolving the topography, the the coastal you know, ocean ocean land contrast, uh, as well as the the you know, local and regional atmospheric processes. Um, does that help to answer the question, though? All right. Um, all right. If anyone, if anyone has one last question, go ahead and uh, make a noise. <laughs> I have a, I have a question. Um, yes, please. I was wondering if there was uh, studies about. Where in the air column, in where in the air column of the atmosphere, um, do concentrations of greenhouse gases sit generally? If if the molecules sort of stratify in the atmosphere, is there a tendency for these? For carbon dioxide to then concentrate in the lower atmosphere. Uh, yeah, so so um, that's a good question, and and it depends on partly on time scale, uh, you know, that you're asking about. So, um, but in general, these are tropospheric uh, tropospheric gases. So uh, the there's uh, for physical reasons there's um, the, the troposphere is ten, the lower the lower part of the atmosphere, the part uh, we live in and fly in in airplanes, um, you know, tends you know, tends to mix uh, at relatively not completely but relatively separately from the stratosphere, the uh, which is which is higher in the atmosphere and where the ozone uh, layer that protects us from UV radiation, for example, uh, exists uh, in the stratosphere. Um, so the, these greenhouse gases are, are uh, it's not that they only exist in the troposphere. Ozone is a greenhouse gas, and there's, it's in the stratosphere. Uh, so water vapor as well. So it, it's not that these gases only exist in the troposphere, but their, uh, their concentrations are, um, for, for CO2, for example, for water vapor, are, are highest in the, in the, 
in the troposphere and um, and are mixed in the troposphere. But there is actually a lot of spatial heterogeneity, particularly on short time scales. And so you might have heard about uh, CO2 domes, for example, over cities where where there can be intense emissions, there can be so there's a lot of variation in concentrations of ozone, concentrations of CO2, concentrations of of NOx, uh, of many atmospheric constituents. Um, I think that there I had one other thought on that. Um, so yeah, it, it depends on the time scale. In general, the longer the time scale, the more the more well mixed. But certainly, there's there are hemispheric and regional and local variations on on uh, on subannual and and, and shorter time scales. Uh, water vapor was the other thought that I had. Uh, so, so water vapor has a very clear gradient uh, in the atmosphere uh, within the troposphere that that uh, follows the temperature gradient. So, the um, you may have heard that a warmer atmosphere can hold more water. Essentially, there's more uh, you know, higher higher levels of water vapor at higher temperature for for thermodynamic reasons, and so. I mean, the, the temperature of the atmosphere is is higher near the surface as a general mean and, and lower as you go up in the troposphere. And so the water vapor follows that that pattern very closely and water vapor is, is itself a greenhouse gas as well. Um, does that help? It does, but I I was wondering actually if if there was so the subtropical high pressure zones mm -hmm. if if there was an effect in that those air parcels kind of co potentially concentrate even more and hold more uh, greenhouse gases within them. Um, yeah, so the 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 um, the water vapor in the atmosphere uh, has and the atmospheric circulation have a number of effects on on the the radiative balance. And they're partly from uh, reflectivity, and so actually the um, the, you know, the clouds and and the, the cloud top uh, will tend to be lighter than the ocean surface, for example. Um, and so so generally in those in those subtropical uh, high pressure centers where there's stable atmosphere and clear sky conditions, there tends to be higher levels of solar energy reaching the surface because of those clear sky conditions. Uh, there also tends to be um, lower relative humidity, uh, so the amount of water vapor in the atmosphere relative to to the temperature tends to be lower, uh, which you know we blue sky clear clear blue sky uh, conditions. Uh, so that can affect um, can affect the radiative balance. It's also the the just the mixing of the atmosphere, the circulation of the atmosphere has has an important um, effect on the on the radiative balance as well. All right. Um, it's uh, we're we're getting close to an hour, so uh, I want to I want to thank everybody for for joining the discussion. This has been a great uh, a great experiment for me to um, to have the first the first discussion of the paper uh, be be uh, in this format with with whoever's interested. Uh, um, so for me, it's been great. Thanks a lot for your questions, uh, helping me think about thinking about how to answer them and. Um, I'll, I'll post a link to to the paper uh, now that it's out. Um, I'll put that on my on my profile page as, uh, and and also a link to to the video for for those who are interested. Uh, so thanks again, everybody, for joining, and hopefully we'll we'll do it again soon. Take care. Thank you.